Hello and welcome. You're listening to the COVID Inquiry podcast. Hosted by Elkin Abrahamson and Nicola Brooke from Brody Jackson Cancer Solicitors, the COVID Inquiry podcast has been designed to provide commentary, opinion and key insights into the hearings from experts and those directly affected by the pandemic. Each week, Elkin and Nicola will be joined by guests to discuss events from the inquiry. Their interviews and conversations will bring you up to date on the implications of the evidential hearings in a readily accessible format, and most importantly of all, in plain English. This week, Elkin is joined by Lorelai King, actor, narrator, screenwriter, and active member of the COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice group. He's also joined by Ender McGarity, one of the lead solicitors representing the COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice Northern Ireland branch in the COVID inquiry. Please note, some listeners may find the contents of this podcast distressing. Hi, this is Elkin Abrahamson, and this is our fourth podcast, I think. Fourth podcast. Wow, it's going fast. And with me is... I'm Laura King, a member of the COVID Bereaved Families for Justice. And like last week, we have with us... Uh, Ender McGarrity, solicitor for Northern Ireland Bereaved Families for Justice. Yeah, we had Ender on last week, and he's passed the audition, so it's allowing him back again this week. Um, first so, up. First up, I think, is the judicial review and the decision of the court. Yes, too long didn't read. The cabinet office lost their case against the COVID inquiry, and um, we're both we're all delighted with that result. Um, I, I think the points I, I'll probably go through it, which will be a bit boring, but there are a couple of legal points that I think probably are worth making, and I'll try and make them in as informal a way as possible. The first point is. Um, we don't think the cabinet office should ever have taken the proceedings. A waste of just, time and money. Horrible. Yeah, yeah. Our time and money. So we had cabinet office, we the taxpayer paying for. The inquiry, we the taxpayer were paying for. Boris Johnson, we the taxpayer were paying for. And I think there was an intervention by the Scottish inquiry. I don't know who's paying for that, but a taxpayer somewhere uh, north or south of the border will be paying for that. And completely unnecessary. And I'll go through the process, but where we ended up was almost where we started with the court saying to the cabinet office, you need to negotiate with the inquiry on the documents that you think are irrelevant, and hopefully you'll reach agreement. And if you don't reach agreement, there's a process under the act which you should follow. So um, I'll, I'll go to the judgment, and as I say, I'll try not to be too technical. And what it was all about was whether the cabinet office should make disclosure of WhatsApp messages and notebooks, mainly um, relating to Boris Johnson, but also relating to a Mr. Cook. And looking at the judgment and looking at the statements that were filed, there was a long process of negotiation between the cabinet office and the inquiry, trying to reach agreement on what was and was not relevant. And trying to, um, I think, agree points of principle as well. Uh, after all of that, the, the inquiry having got nowhere, they issued a formal notice under what's called Section 21 of the Inquiries Act, and this is where it gets a bit legal. I'm sorry about that. But it's a, a section which empowers the chair of an inquiry to say to someone, give me all the documents related to the issues, and, and this is what I'm after. The cabinet office then said under section 21.4 and again apologies um, being legalistic we're going to challenge that because it's not reasonable in all the circumstances for us to be required to comply with the notice and what they did was challenge the whole notice instead of challenging that part of the notice relating to particular documents so the high court was faced with this issue that it's in up to the cabinet office to decide what is relevant to the inquiry and to make the decision as to what should therefore be disclosed. And there are a number of problems with that argument, leaving aside the legal argument, but practical implication. So if, for instance, I do something and I'm subject to a, a statutory inquiry because of something I do wrong, would it be right for me to say to the inquiry, well, I'm going to decide what's relevant and I'm going to decide what you see? There has to be a process which requires someone external to me to make that decision and in fact the way the the act um, is drafted it's the high court ultimately that can make that decision we haven't got to that stage yet 
But what the High Court and the Judicial Review said was, we're not going to set aside the request for documents in its entirety or at all. There is a process. If you, if you the Cabinet Office, want to say that the inquiry is asking for irrelevant documents, you say that. Um, we're going to give you, I think they gave them a week or so to put in an application pursuant to that section 21.4, which I've mentioned, that it's unreasonable to produce this particular material because it doesn't relate to a matter in question at the inquiry. If the chair says, I disagree with you, I think it does relate, there is then a process for the chair to refer the matter to the High Court for enforcement. Uh, and if the Cabinet Office still complies, you then go on to criminal proceedings. And that's the proper process. So why the Cabinet Office went off at a tangent running this judicial review, I don't really understand. But um, so far, we're in a happy place. And let's keep yeah, a happy place. For the everyone family. was beaming, including Baroness Hallett, who broke off and, and, and uh, called for a break just as the results were coming out. I know it's going to mean a tremendous amount to the COVID Bereave Families for Justice UK. We, um, as many of us could in London, went to the High Court and we sat in on the, on the hearing. Um, they could use some good speakers. That's all I'm going to say. It was very hard to hang on to what they were saying. But we wanted to make our our presence known. Um, and what was the reaction of the brief, COVID brief families for justice Northern Ireland when they heard about this? Yeah, I know they're gathered today in Belfast, actually, because uh, the Northern Ireland witnesses were giving evidence today. So the news has probably just trickled through. Uh, and it will be relief, I think, that this saga is at an end or, or near an end. Um, they'll be happy that the integrity of, of this, inqu not only this inquiry, but inquiries in general has been um uh, has been upheld today to some extent so yeah one one of relief more than anything i imagine when this this if you call it an action was first brought i know that the brief families you can't worry devastated it just seemed like such a blow that um to put this kind of roadblock in the way of an inquiry that had already started and i imagine your families felt similar absolutely um they're very exercised about not only what the the local politicians have um, have done during the pandemic, but the central government politicians as well. Uh, and I think of Brenda Doherty, one of the group leads in Northern Ireland, um, whose uh, mother died in around the time of the the party gate uh, issues, and um, she's been very exercised about this particular issue. So I'm I'm very very happy for her today. I'm happy too for that, but also because. Also, still outraged at how much it it cost us. It just seems such an unnecessary expense, the taxpayer and the delay. So, um, I'd also add to that before you sort of drain the last of the champagne glass. Think about this: the fact that the government is currently under a duty to disclose the documents to the chair of the inquiry does not mean that we get to see them. She still decides, first of all, if they're relevant at all. And secondly, if they're relevant, whether they're disclosable. She yep. made signs are not disclosable. And what's your view on that, Elkin? Well, I, w what I've said is we hope that they are as open and transparent with us as they were saying the Cabinet Office should be with them and that we get to see them and, and get to decide for ourselves how important they are. I, yeah. I think you agree. Totally agree, yeah. Uh, and the, the other point, I think, is, as you said, Ender, it's not just the UK Cabinet Office that is affected by this decision. There will be a, a, a number of other participants thinking, oh, perhaps I'd better rethink my strategy now on this. So hopefully it will overall lead to a more open inquiry. And you need to have an open and transparent inquiry or else you're impacting on the integrity of the inquiry. And what we don't want people saying at the end of three to five years of evidence is, well, these, these recommendations aren't worth anything because it wasn't based on a full examination of all the documentation and witnesses. Yes, I was uh, discussing with a couple of people when, when we had the news. It would have been such a blow to morale if yeah. it had gone the other way. I think we all would have been disheartened. Yeah, absolutely. So good news. Big sigh of relief. Let's yeah. move on. Yeah, let's move on. Speaking of which, shall we talk about... It's an interesting day. We had a lot of uh, Welsh witnesses from Wales, but we're going to hold off on that till. Yeah. Next week. So there were quite a few, as you say, Welsh witnesses, and um, we wanted to discuss it with um, our barrister, who um, is dealing with the Wales issues. But 
because he's not available today, we're going to put that off and get back to that next week. I thought it was, again, pretty much um, devolved nation state because we had a couple of it, witnesses from, from Northern Ireland. Yeah. So the uh, today there was uh, two witnesses from Northern Ireland. Uh, the first one was Dr. Dennis McMahon, uh, and he is the permanent secretary to the executive office in Northern Ireland. And this was an interesting one because his evidence was quite a climb down from his statement and his department's statements. Um, and there was concessions towards the end of his evidence that the um, the submissions and the opening statements from bereaved families ha- helped to change his mind and change his approach. So that that was good to hear. Um, I'll talk a bit about um, uh, what came out from his evidence. Um, he accepted uh, that Northern Ireland did not have the same uh, legal protections as citizens in the rest of the UK. Uh, a lot of our families will be uh, alarmed to, to, to hear that. Uh, but also, um, you know, glad that there's been a concession in that regard, and there seems to be uh, quite a, a forceful uh, acceptance that there uh, there's a need for legislative reform, which of course is one of the key goals of our group. And this seems like a very uh, a tangible uh, tangible change that can and, and should happen. He said something that made me think of what you'd said last week. He said. Um that the impact on emergency planning was was largely down to the the lack of ministers between 2017 and 2020. Yeah. Is that like not having a government? Is that what you meant last week or have I misunderstood? No, that that was exactly it. And it's it's important not to understate that point uh, as well because uh, in the simplest terms, um, preparedness and resilience planning wasn't good in any of the UK nations. But in the absence of a government uh, for three years in the immediate uh, period before the pandemic, they they were really really appalling in in Northern Ireland, and that's came out to uh, to quite a large extent today. Uh, Dr. Dr. McMahon, McMahon talked about the lack of adequate resources for civil contingencies. He gave an example of the civil service between twenty fourteen and twenty seventeen having lost four thousand four hundred jobs, which was a fifth of the civil service workforce. That gives an insight into how. Um, completely stripped uh, the civil contingencies uh, services were when it came to actually mounting a response. I was going to ask you about that because I made a note of that as well, that they lost over 4,000 employees between 2014 and 17 that were never replaced. What what happened during that period to cause that? Well, there, you, you give reference to a, a number of things, but basically it was other areas getting priority. And the, the, the biggest one, of course, which came a bit later, was uh, Operation Yellowhammer, the EU exit plans. He talked quite a lot about that, and he used an interesting, um, slightly grotesque phrase uh, that uh, they cannibalized the department due to the pressures of, of EU exit planning. So I think he was, he was at pains to uh, push that, that argument. What did you make of him? Uh, I- brought us back to the opening statement from Northern Ireland Department of Health, wasn't it, where they yeah. said the lack of an executive had no impact at all. Yeah. And you thought, I mean, we didn't we didn't take it seriously at the time, but as the evidence has emerged, it's so obvious that that can't possibly be correct. And we did say, I think, at the time that their words have come back to haunt them, and so it has. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, um, for, for Dr. McMahon in particular, he came into post, uh, it's a new post actually, the Permanent Secretary for the Executive Office. He came into post in July 2021. So he himself wasn't likely to ever face any major criticism, but he gave us quite a good insight into the structures that uh, underlie uh, his, his predecessors. And he probably held his hand close enough to the fire without, without really getting burnt himself. And our second uh, witness from Northern Ireland was Rob- Robin Swan. He was, oh, that's that's two birds. Robin Swan, what a lovely name. Just noticed that. that <laughs> yeah. um, but he was the last witness of today, I believe. He was. Uh, and Robin Swan, uh, the Minister for Health for Northern Ireland, came into post in January 2020 when the executive reformed. Um, and we were rather disappointed uh, uh, that, that there w- wasn't more... Uh, concessions from Mr. Swan. I, I don't think he. I think he got quite an easy ride uh, today. Um, toward the end, obviously, we we uh, had a question about scientific advice and the role that scientific advice plays in a depart the Department of Health and in particular 
the importance a minister would place on that advice. Um, so Ronan Laverty KC, on behalf of the Northern Ireland families, uh, asked a question about the chief scientific advisor for Northern Ireland, who in his statement commented that he didn't give any advice uh, for five years prior to the pandemic from 2015, and he didn't give that advice because he wasn't asked for it. So obviously quite a shocking remark, and we uh, contrasted that with the comments of uh, Sir Patrick Valance, where he characterised the role of chief scientific advisor as being a proactive role. And it's not about waiting to be asked, it's about giving the correct advice. Um, so at the end, Minister Swan accepted that it wasn't an acceptable position and uh, that you simply have to wait for advice and it should be a more proactive approach. So that was one useful uh, concession, but we would have been hoping for, for more today. It reminds me of what Elkin often says because uh, Robin Swan was the first Northern Ireland politician that appeared at the inquiry, I believe. Yeah. And Elkin, you always say it's the poly and you mentioned Patrick Valance, the scientists are the ones who are willing to take accountability and all that, and politicians seem a bit yeah. more slippery. And, and there's another theme which is emerging, which is that some of the experts, as you've said, and uh, say, well, I won't proffer advice on something until someone asks me for it. And then you get the ministers saying, well, I just look at the document and I don't ask behind it. So if the ministers aren't asking and the scientists aren't offering, mm -hmm. there's this gap between the two. Yeah, absolutely. And um, speaking of, of gaps, that, that uh, reminds me of the uh, legislative uh, gap that there is in Northern Ireland as well, which was pushed a little bit with Swan but it really it really didn't go far enough and he was given the excuse of, of having only been in post in January uh, 2020 but uh, that wouldn't have stopped him from giving his views on whether the legislative framework in Northern Ireland was adequate moving forward so in a lesson le lessons learned context we didn't get uh, as far as we would have wanted today yeah. he, he suggested something um, I didn't quite know what it meant. He said he suggested there should be automatic representation on SAGE for the devolved nations. Yeah, and it comes back to this uh, this idea of scientific advice and the extent to which it feeds into decision making. So um, there was there was no um, automatic involvement of Northern Ireland scientific advisors on SAGE um, or any minister uh, and then that changed once the pandemic struck. And uh, I think the comments were basically it would be helpful if in future uh, there were representatives from each of the four nations feeding in to a UK-wide sort of scientific uh, framework. Yes, and, and the pattern that is emerging to varying degrees but from all the devolved nations is the UK government didn't take any of them seriously, um, didn't share information as much as they should have done, didn't cooperate with them as much as they should have done, sort of left them out in the cold almost, and that probably more with Northern Ireland than with maybe the other two devolved nations, but it seems to be the same for all of them. Yeah, absolutely, and, and also in, in Northern Ireland, you've got the unique context of having a border with the Republic of Ireland uh, and the considerations that, which uh, that present. Um, Minister Swan gave evidence today that there was a lot of uh, adequate uh, communication between Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. I think the evidence suggests otherwise, but uh, it's probably going to be looked at more in Module 2 or 2C. Um, they, they didn't seem to want to get into it today, so uh, we'll have to wait to see uh, what comes out of that. You think it's this, this English attitude to colonies that we've lost all the colonies, we've only got the devolved nations to lord it over now. <laughs> So let's be arrogant of Lord Graham. I mean, I did, I, we'll talk about Wales next week, but I also noticed they were sort of blaming Westminster for not giving them additional yeah. funding for what they were asking them mm -hmm. to do. So I think it is a complaint shared among the nations. And in fact, just thinking about that lack of funding, that was one of the problems with the Civil Contingencies Act, that was shifting responsibility to local authorities in all the four nations, but not transferring resources to help them fulfill those responsibilities. We also had a couple of uh, witnesses from the UK. We had Professor Jim McManus, 
who was president of the Association of Directors of Public Health. I feel like Yeah. And, and we also had Kevin Fenton, president of the UK Faculty of Public Health. I thought the public health people made some really interesting points. Um, Jim McManus said that the communic again, blaming central government, said communication was was so poor that to discover decisions, they were having to read the newspapers or watch the TV. Yeah. That, that was that was a very strong comment, wasn't it? And, and it sort of brought home the picture of them thinking, what are we supposed to be doing here? A bit like all of us thinking, what are we supposed to be doing? We're sitting at home. Government keeps telling us to do one thing and then another. Um, so, yeah, as you say, some of them only learned about policy changes on the TV. The national system for tracing infected contacts was set up from scratch instead of using existing local frameworks. Some of the national officials hadn't read their own guidance. Um, some local authorities later took on the national test and trace system, and he said there was marked improvement after that. This really struck me that, that uh, him presenting public health as, as an untapped resource. It was like wasted because, as you mentioned, the tra uh, tracing and tracking. But he said they know a lot. They know about controlling in, uh, infections in settings like care homes, and I thought that's you know, something Matt Hancock, a resource he could have exploited. And it just seems a waste not to have used their expertise. And in fact, it reminded me when we were looking for, I can't even remember, it was, but it must have been a, a testing centre. Mm -hmm. And you went on the website and got an address. And I remember going to the address and it just wasn't there. Nobody knew what I was talking about. Nobody knew where it was. Whereas if it had been done locally, you, the local body would have known where to put these centres. Um, and in fact, he mentioned putting a vaccine centre half a mile from a deprived area with no public transport. And that was more or less the situation that we were in, in Liverpool, I remember. But I'd completely forgotten about that until he he raised that example. Yes, and that example again shows the inequalities, which which is something that yeah. comes up again and again in this inquiry. Yeah. Yeah, the public, the public health official for Northern Ireland was supposed to be uh, Wednesday, which I think was public health day because all of the officials were in on the same day. Uh, but he's been moved now until until next week. So, yeah, I agree. All very interesting, and I, and I was looking forward to hearing uh, what what Aidan Dawson had to say. So, uh, we'll have to reserve that until next week. Mm -hmm. And Kevin Fenton. Yeah, Pe Kevin Fenton, President of the UK Faculty of Health Professional Standards Body for Public Health Specialists. So again, he's one of the senior public health uh, personnel. And he was talking about um, impacts on groups with protective characteristics. We missed opportunities to understand them. We didn't really have the data. Um, and he said something that I thought was quite interesting. He's just saying just having the data isn't enough. We need to ensure that we have the stories as well. So you understand what's behind the data. It's yes. not just these dry stats. Uh, so I thought it was quite an interesting point. And he said the Civil Contingencies Act was complex, archaic, and not fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, again, I don't think anyone is disputing that. Shall we touch on, just because I found it really interesting, Mark Woolhouse, who was a professor of infectious disease epidemiology at the University of Edinburgh. I mean, we could talk about it more next week as connected to Calderwood's evidence. You know, I'm glad you said that because I made a note of a few comments he made. Mm. Um, he said he was giving the analogy of backing the favourite on the Grand National, close to my heart as I'm from Liverpool. Um, and he said it's it's all very well to back the winner, but the winner doesn't always win. And in, in the context of the Grand National, where there are a whole load of horses, very often the winner doesn't win. And sort of translating that to our context, where there's a whole range of viruses, focusing on a pandemic flu virus was all very well, but you've got to think about all the other viruses in the race as well. And the, Others will will come home to roost. Um, and his other analogy was saying that the UK prepared for the wrong exam, which again I thought was an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, I thought he was an interesting witness overall. He was, and and he um, he's another data guy. He said it was he criticised the extraordinarily onerous procedures for gathering um, scientific data in in Scotland. The thing that um, really struck me about him, though, is that he is a bit of a Cassandra in that he warned that you know, future pandemic, it's happening. And it's happening soon. And it may be more deadly. It was really the most doom-mongering that I think I've heard so far. 
absolutely yeah uh, i got that impression mm. uh, as well and in, as part of his analogy i suppose the, the thrust of it was encouraging flexibility and um also signposting that in the past we were absolutely planning for uh, one certain outcome uh, and in the future that simply cannot be the case yeah, the other thing I was thinking about that is when you're in government organisations, we've heard about groupthink, and you don't want to be that guy, the one walking up and down the corridors going, we're all doomed, we're all doomed. <laughs> and the fact that he was prepared to be that person, I think, speaks to how strongly he must have felt yeah. about it. That he was prepared to put his head above, above the parapet on. Yeah. He said, this is something you should be concerned about and yeah. you should be prepared for. The next pandemic could be far more difficult to handle than COVID-19 was. Uh, yeah, I'm br bringing it back to the point I made about uh, ministers and government uh, officials not asking the right questions of, of scientists. He made a very striking uh, comment about you can't trust the government to ask the right question. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought, I thought that was very... Uh, poignant in, in, in that it really proves the point uh, in Northern Ireland, at least that's what I was thinking about, uh, that the questions weren't being asked and therefore no advice was being given. And because of our system of government, you rarely have someone in charge of a department who has the skills of that department because they come and go all the time. Uh, and that sort of gives them an ex the excuse to say, well, I was just relying on my scientists. But the fact that you're not an expert in a particular field doesn't absolve you of critical analysis of the information that's presented to you. And we keep hearing about assurance and reassurance and that the politicians are using the terms interchangeably. I can't remember if I've spoken about this. I think you did touch on but explain, explain again the, re the difference for us. The, the reassurance is um, people have told me this is all right. I know they're reliable people and therefore I'm reassured by them telling me that. Ashley means I've been given sets of data. I can triangulate them from different sets of data from different areas. And on the basis of that, I'm satisfied that what they're telling me is correct. Um, so just saying, oh, well, if my scientist tells me that I'm assured is actually an, an incorrect use of the word assured. The politicians seem to be using them interchangeably. The specialists, the scientists, seem to be using assured in the way I understand it. But I'm not entirely sure because, not entirely assured, because Hugo Keith isn't saying to them, when you say assured, what do you mean? Do you mean you're relying on independent data or do you mean someone said something to you and you're trusting them? Uh, so, so there's a bit of a language gap, I think, at the moment there. Yeah. Yeah, we don't really have the time or we're not being afforded the time to drill down into these uh, these issues and that, that that's really necessary. You just mentioned time and I know we're a week four, we have two more weeks, but I just wonder how you both feel about the length of time for this module, about how complete the evidence will be. Scandalously sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think to, to have a proper look at resilience it would need to be significantly longer. Um, witnesses are very often rushed. Uh, again, I'm, I'm thinking about today's witnesses from a biased point of view on Northern Ireland. We had the Minister for Health up for no more than, than 45 minutes uh, with five minutes of questioning from, from ourselves as representatives to the bereaved family. So, um, yeah, extremely rushed. I, I, the sense I'm getting is that the inquiry legal team at least knows where they want to go. They know what sort of structure they want to suggest as a solution for next time. And they're putting those structures to all the witnesses. Um, but where a witness doesn't necessarily agree with the structure, they're not exploring why they don't agree. And very often they're getting answers, but not exploring the reasoning for those answers. I'm trying to think of examples. So, um, where, where a minister, for instance, says, well, I relied on the scientists, they don't say, well, why are you relying on that scientist? Is that the way you always conduct your decision-making process? Are there problems with that approach that we need to think about for the future? Uh, they just move on to the next question because of the shortness of time, but it's the shortness of time that's been imposed by the inquiry, partly for valid considerations because we don't want to take 20 years, um, but I just think it's far too short for preparation. I would personally have spent four times as long on preparation 
and truncated some of the other ones. Absolutely, because it, I think it's clear from some of the, the the evidence that has come out that we're really starting from a position of error uh, across the UK in terms of preparedness. And you know, it's not it's not sufficient to just take a glancing look at that. We need to really dig into why that was the case, and then that's going to help us to understand what happened when the pandemic struck and what happened thereafter, and that'll be explored in further modules. So I agree, this is the, the vital starting point. Especially if it's about recommendations, and what you're saying makes absolute sense, because how can we learn what to recommend if we haven't, as you say, drilled down into what what we're wrong in the preparation? Yeah, I think I think we're we're getting there with some some of our um, uh, some of our goals. Um, taking, for example, uh, some of the legislative gaps, I think there's some fairly achievable and, and straightforward changes that can be made following this. But uh, it's about what hasn't been explored in, in detail. We're we're getting some progress, but uh, it's about what hasn't been looked at as well. Can I ask um, sort of a general question? Because my understanding is that Baroness Hallett intends to present her recommendations at the end of each module. When how long would that would that be something that will come before module two or? She said next year. Oh, and it didn't say before module two, and there's a process called the salmon process where if you're critical of people, you give them the chance of responding to that criticism. So she follows that process. That drags it out a bit, but it, you can understand the reasons for that. Um, it doesn't necessarily follow that for every improvement in the process, we have to wait to see what the inquiry recommends. It could be that governments may decide what well, it's obvious this, this needs doing. Uh, everyone's saying that, let's just crack off. And it also doesn't necessarily follow that all her recommendations will be considered, let alone approved. If these last three, four weeks have taught me anything, it's that the number of times we've seen recommendations have been made yeah. and not implemented. I mean... Yeah. Yeah, like for example, to, today we had what seemed to be, as I said, a, a complete U-turn from some of our uh, important witnesses uh, who had offered up sort of a smoke and mirrors uh, type statement where you couldn't quite pin them down on, on something. And when we first seen those, we were very disappointed because we thought, you know, how can we affect change if there's no acceptance of faults in the first place? Uh, thankfully, today we've had a bit of a, a U-turn on that and there's at least acceptance uh, that there were there were errors. So uh, the next stage, as you, as you say, is what happens next? Are they going to fix them? It, it's really interesting because earlier on in, in the hearings, I thought there were some witnesses whose statements were a lot more strident than they came across in the box. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting the personalities, isn't it, and how they react to actually being in the witness box. And some of the witnesses today had clearly thought about it. Since they made the one of them had said, I, I've thought about it a lot since I've made my statement and I've now reached a different position. Yeah. Which I thought good on him. And people are also watching the inquiry. At, take, for example, Dr. McMahon this morning. He was very conscious not to use too much jargon. Uh, the, the plethora of acronyms that we've heard throughout the inquiry, he was conscious to avoid that. He knows what Lady Hallett is, um, uh, you know, is particularly exercised about. And uh, he seemed to play to that a little bit. So it's clear that people are, are watching the inquiry and, and, and where the direction of travel is. Clearly he's watching it too and learning from it, which yeah. why not? Why wouldn't you? Yeah, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Another of her pet hates is the organizational structures that that she and um, Hugo Keith see as vastly overcomplicated. I'm not sure they're necessarily right. And I, I don't, they may, they may be right. But uh, but when you explore it with the witnesses, many of them say, well, it looks very complicated. When you actually get into it, each body has its own function and, and there's a reason for that. So um, I, I, I'm not sure even by the end of the inquiry we would have explored that fully. And that takes us to that interesting question of what happens afterwards, either with the recommendations or with the evidence. Um, and, and as a body, we, COVID bereaved, will want to take the negotiations to government and to other academic bodies to make sure that it's discussed further as well. Well, absolutely. And I think what Mark Woolhouse said when he said, you know, you should be concerned about it and prepared for it, the next pandemic could be worse. That kind of inspires me to want to carry on with, with everything we're doing to make sure that these, beyond the inquiry, to make sure that these things are implemented. implemented.
It's important. Next week, we have some big hitters from Northern Ireland. And uh, yeah, I see they've just been published today. So we yeah. can talk about them. Yeah. Um, we've got the uh, former uh, First Minister, uh, Dame Marlene Foster. And we have uh, the First Minister designate, Michelle O'Neill. Uh, we have Richard Pikegane. Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin, yes. And Arle- Arlene Foster, DUP. Um, and we have the Richard Pengelly, who is the Permanent Secretary to the, the Department of Health, and Michael McBride, the Chief Medical Officer, and a, a couple of others as well. So, um, yeah, a big week for uh, for the Northern Ireland families. I'm sure they'll be uh, watching on keenly. Uh, I would like to see some of the political uh, witnesses pursued a, a little bit for, uh, more stringently than Minister Swan was today. Uh, I, I think the civil servants have had a, a will have a big say, as we've seen today with Dr. McMahon, because of the lack of an executive. Like, I, I think he acknowledged that for the past six years, four of those years, there have been no ministers, which is, is shocking, obviously, but it also points to the fact that the civil servants uh, are also people who we really need to hear from, uh, and hopefully we'll do that next week. Exciting. And then on the last day we have the UK back again with Michael Go- Gove Michael well, Gove I'm not sure we'll get much from him but we'll see <laughs> well thank you Enda for coming again and hope, hope to have a chance to speak to you next week about those witnesses yeah absolutely really looking forward to it and let's say you made your fly back this time yeah, yeah it's, time. <laughs> it's delayed every week so <laughs> <what that is. laughs> thanks everyone thank you you Thank you for listening to this instalment of the COVID Inquiry podcast. Elkin, Nicola and the team at Brody Jackson Cantor are looking forward to bringing you more expert commentary, opinion and insight next week as the COVID Inquiry hearings continue.